All right, welcome everyone to Map Time Davis. My name is Michelle Tobias. I am the Geospatial Data Specialist at UC Davis Data Lab. Um, and I just want to welcome you all. I'm really glad that you're here. Um, this should be a, a good workshop, I'm hoping. Um, today we are going to be talking about coordinate reference systems or projections or projected coordinate systems in R. Um, so this is the this is the big projection workshop. Um, if you are having any kind of challenges with projections, hopefully we can iron some of that out today. And specifically, we're, we're going to be looking at R. Um, I'm going to share my screen real quick. I think that will be easier. It's going to drop in the thing I'm looking at. Sorry, Zoom controls are in my way. <laughs> they always seem to be in the wrong spot for me. OK, so while I'm dragging those around the screen. Um, so. I will post links in the chat window for the things I'm going to show you. Let me grab those. Just grabbing these links and I'm going to paste them in the chat when I find the chat thing in. Here it is. Maybe. Sorry, when you present, finding the chat with Zoom is a little bit challenging. Apologies, I'm just having technical difficulties. Fine, we'll do, oh, I it docked it, super helpful Zoom, sorry. Um, here we go. So I'm pasting links in the um, in the chat window to the MapTime Davis website, and I can share my screen again, um, where we list all of our workshops and also the videos of the previous workshops when we get them posted. Um, so you can have that, I'll show you right now. Um, down towards the bottom, you'll see our schedule for the rest of the quarter. So we're uh, just about halfway through. Um, next week, we have uh, more R coming up. So Wesley Brooks, our, um, one of our data scientists at UC Davis Data Lab, will be giving a workshop on spatial stats in R. So if you're here today, great, because next week um, we'll kind of follow along. Um, you know, the things you learn today will probably be useful for next week. Um, so that's great. Uh, after that, um, the following week on May 11th, um, I will be back with a MapTime Davis Studio session about art software for cartography. So if you are working on finishing maps, making them look nice for publication, and you have questions about how to do that, I'm going to be showing some of my workflow with Inkscape, um, which is also pretty applicable if you're working in uh, Adobe Illustrator too. Um, really similar concepts, um, but I use the open source one because I can afford it. I don't have to pay for it um, because it's open source and it's also a really good product. Um, so come join us for that. And then finally, um, on May 18th, we will be having a lightning talk session. Uh, we still need people to sign up for lightning talks. Um, I would highly recommend if you would like to do a lightning talk that you do that, um, sign up for that soon. Um, again, the link that I paste it into the chat, you can go there. And if you click on the lightning talks, it'll link to how to sign up for that. Um, it's a really good chance to give a quick talk about what you're working on with your research or your ideas you're having, questions you've got. Maybe you learned something new and you just want to share it with the community. Um, I highly recommend doing it. It's fun. They're really fun to watch, but they're also really fun to organize. They really make you boil down your, uh, your point into a very concise short talk. Um, so anyway, um, I highly recommend doing that. I think it's going to be a fun time. I need to figure out if I want to do one if what I want to talk about. <laughs> but I really want you guys to, to share what you're working on. This is your chance to connect with the community before we all go off to summer things. All right, so there's that. Um, the other link I put into the chat is a link to the um, Map Time Davis Council application, which I can show you here. Not that you all can't use the internet, but um, Map Time Davis Council is a new way to participate in Map Time. The idea is that we will form a group that will help organize Map Time events um, and also organize the the things that, in general, the Spatial Science Research and Learning Cluster, which is actually the body that produces Map Time, uh, what they do. So, uh, if you have ideas for talks and workshops and things like that, or if you want to not just have talks and workshops, if you want to do other things with the spatial science research and learning cluster, 
please apply for uh, for this. Um, we're to the point where we've got one one main organizer, which is me, and we need more people to me keep this working and keep it going. So, uh, if you like Map Time uh, and you've got you know a you can spare, you know, an hour or two per month helping to organize this. Please apply. I really would like to see some more folks uh, putting in applications. And I know we've got some really good uh, people out there with good networks and good ideas. So um, can't emphasize this enough. We need help to keep this going. So please, please apply. Um, and I see in the chat that Evelyn has posted uh, her email address if you want to sign up for um, Lightning Talks, who wants more information, contact Evelyn about that. Again, super awesome opportunities between all of the things we have going on. So please, please participate, sign up for all kinds of things. <laughs> Basically, we want to see your faces. We miss seeing people. So join uh, and participate. Um, so there's my, uh, my spiel for all of that. I'm, I really do want to see more people joining up. Um, OK, so. Um, really quick, I need to take a quick look at our list of participants. Um, apologies for a second, this is going to maybe do something weird. Okay, thanks for sitting tight with me for a second. Okay, so um, let me just check my notes and make sure I've told you everything you need to know about things that are coming up with Map Time Davis. I think we have. So, um, this is what I want to land on. Um, the other thing about this workshop is that this is a co-production with uh, with the Davis R Users Group, which meets right now on Mondays. Um, in the mornings, if uh, you love R, you work with R, and you need more help with R, or you want to connect with other folks who are using R for research, um, the Davis R Users Group is an amazing place to find other folks who work specifically with R. Um, there are a lot of people who work with spatial R that come to that. Uh, so if you are a spatial person, you will not be alone. There's quite a few people who work with spatial things uh, that go to that group. So I would encourage you to join them on Mondays. Um, I know there's some discussion about moving the time. So if you if you have preferences, maybe now's the time to join the group and uh, help make some decisions around that. Okay, so I think um, if you have any questions about anything we just talked about logistics wise, I'm going to drop them in the chat right now. Um, otherwise, I think we are good to get going on today's workshop. So let me Crab, I've got some more links for you for today. Um, so I'm going to paste a couple links in the chat, um, one of which is the link to the materials, which you've got, um, I'm, I have on my screen share right now. Um, and the, the other one is to the data for today. So um, I think the data download should be pretty quick, but it might be a good idea to start that now while we're going to do a quick intro. Uh, do some concept uh, lecture type material and before we get to the hands on part. So it's a good time now if you want to start the download um, just to make sure you've got it and ready to go. Um, and if that uh, for some reason the data link doesn't work, let me know and I'll, I'll go change permissions. It's on a UC Davis box account. So sometimes it's hard to get it to let people actually download stuff. Seeing no questions popping up in the chat, I think we're ready to go and move on. So again, that um, the link to the materials is in the chat for you. We've got um, a brand new set of workshop materials for today to work with. Um, I just revamped this and we put it into the new format that Data Lab is using for our workshop. So let me know how these go if you have suggestions or um, uh, thoughts about the new format um, versus using just the plain old GitHub markdown, let me know. Um, but I think this this looks pretty nice in general. So today, um, again, today's workshop is about coordinate reference systems. Uh, in R, um, we've got this set up so that eventually we can expand this to other things besides R related to coordinate reference systems. So that's why it's formatted this way. Uh, so today's workshop is um, We've got some uh, like this is normal for us like learning objectives. Um, the idea for today's workshop is that 
you're going to learn more about projected coordinate systems, uh, why you would pick one over the other, how to apply them correctly to geospatial data in R for this particular workshop. Um, and I just want to say projections are one of those things that are hard. <laughs> it's one of the things that makes your brain hurt. Um, I hate to that's kind of a downer thought, but like it just it's one of those things that, you know, you learn. I like to think of it as learning in layers like today we're going to sort of scratch the surface. I'm not going to get into tons of details about the inner workings of projections that could be an entire class in itself. Um, so we're going to the plan today is to give you enough information that you can operate within uh, R and generally with geospatial data and have enough to know what you're doing. Um, if you want to know more details, this workshop will give you the language that you can then use to go and look up other things. Um, so, sorry, I'm just getting distracted by something real quick. Okay. Um, so again, today, today we're not going to learn absolutely everything about projections. You're going to learn enough to get going and to make good decisions and to work with your data well when it needs to have a projected coordinate system or any kind of coordinate system. Uh, the prereqs for today are that I'm going to assume you have experience with R, um, just the basics. Like you should be able to create a variable and uh, know how to load common formats like CSVs. All the materials, all of the code and stuff like that will be here for you to copy and paste. So that should make things go a little bit quicker. Um, but I'm not going to start from the beginning with R. We're going to assume that you've got um, just the basic knowledge um, and that you also have a little bit of understanding of how spatial data works because it's only a two hour workshop. <laughs> uh, OK, so um, that being said, let's jump into some of the concepts for today. So I'm going to start with a little bit of um, kind of background information and concepts and the whole what is a projection thing. And then we're going to do the hands on part of this. So um, if you're just here to learn about the you know concepts, great. Um, if you're really excited to learn about the, the hands on stuff in R, great. That's coming in a few minutes. So just sit back. Um, it's always good to go over projections, though. <laughs> I feel like not a day working with geospatial data. I don't learn something new um, and that is normal. OK, so introduction stuff. OK, so we um, let me make this text a little bit bigger, both for you and for me. <laughs> OK, so um, I'm going to be working off these materials pretty closely, so um, feel free to follow along there. Um, and I will I will go back and forth between this text and also showing you um, our once we get to the actual hands on coding. So um, Here's the deal. The Earth, we think of it as round. Um, we can describe it as a geoid. So it's something generally spherical. It has some kind of bumps and distortions. I wish I had a globe, but I don't. Um, I think I should have grabbed it. My cats have a little stress ball that has like a globe printed on it for good visuals, but I didn't grab it and it's not handy. <laughs> so um, we generally think of the Earth as being a sphere, right? Um, some people describe it as a geoid. Basically, that means it's kind of round. It has some bumpy things like mountains. It also has some deviations if you think about the surface. It's not really a perfect sphere, but we can think of it as spherical. Um, the problem becomes not from it being a spherical like shape. The problem is that we like to represent maps as being flat surfaces. So trying to take something from this round a spherical shape and then translate that into a flat map or a flat computer screen. Uh, that's where we have problems and that's where we introduce um, error and distortions and things like that. Um, so if we want to take measurements from this round spherical object and make them flat, we have to do something to transform them. We have to do a mathematical process on it um, to make it flat and also to um, also to, to reduce the amount of distortion that we see in certain ways. Um, more details to come if that was a vague statement. Um, and so once we transform the data, the data exists in something called a coordinate reference system, which is what we're going to be talking about today. Um, so there are three parts to a general coordinate reference system. And again, this, this section about um, the parts of a coordinate reference system, you can go into so much more depth if you want. Um, I would recommend, uh, I'm not looking at my screen to see, 
this is a really good book. I believe it's linked at the bottom of our workshop materials. It's called GIS Fundamentals uh, by Paul Bolstad. I like this book. There are plenty of other good books that deal with projections um, and, and GIS data in general. Um, one thing I like about uh, GIS Fundamentals that I just showed you for learning these things, um, the book is written very well. It's very accessible, but we also have a subscription to it right now through Hathi Trust um, with the UC Davis Library. Um, to the, I have the sixth edition on my desk right now, but we have, I think, the fourth or fifth edition, which is just fine for learning about uh, coordinate reference systems that, you know, the science behind that doesn't change drastically from, from edition to edition. So um, if you can't get to the library to look at it in person, we do have the digital subscription with Hathi Trust right now, um, among other things. So check that out uh, if you are interested in learning about this in more depth. Okay, so that being said, I'm going to we're going to scratch the surface today. Um, oh yeah, Naomi just put the link to Paul Bolstad's book. Um, it's the one I learned from and I just, I have the older version locked in my uh, actual physical office in the library, but obviously I haven't been there in a year, <laughs> so I don't order the new one. Um, okay, so there's three parts of a coordinate reference system that you need to know about uh, in order to work with them in R and also generally with digital spatial data. Um, so coordinate reference system is three parts. We've got the datum, the projection and additional parameters. That's it. Um, we're going to focus mostly on the, the projection part of this today, but we'll also go over the other parts um, just a little bit. So you've got that knowledge and, and terminology. Okay, so a common analogy when we're talking about projections is this orange peel analogy. And I was peer pressured on Twitter this morning to get you an actual orange. Well, this is a Mandarin, but it will do. Um, so it is really common to use this orange peel or citrus analogy when we're talking about the earth. So if you imagine that the earth is an orange, um, or in this case, a mandarin, it's not very earth shaped, <laughs> um, how you peel this peel off and how you flatten it out will uh, is kind of the analogy for a projection. So how you flatten it out is, is kind of how projections get made. Um, so I will use this analogy because Quite frankly, it's silly and it's nice to think about silly things when you're thinking about heavy things like projections, which are hard to understand. Um, so if this is a useful analogy, great. If you think it's weird and silly and you don't like it, just ignore it. <laughs> you take, take what you need, leave what you don't. Um, okay, so the first part, again, three parts of the projected coordinate system, the datum, the projection, and then the other things. So the datum is the model of the shape of the earth. So we talked earlier about how the Earth is a, is a geoid. Um, so a datum is, is the model of the shape of the Earth. Um, so it has angular units uh, and it, it has a defined starting point. So where is the origin? Um, in a lot of global projections, that origin is uh, the equator and also the line that goes through Greenwich, England, um, the prime meridian. So those two things cross and you get the origin zero, zero. Um, just for fun, I will tell you that that spot zero, zero is affectionately referred to in the geo community as Null Island. A lot of data ends up at Null Island when things go wrong. Um, so if you ever get the chance to go to a geospatial conference in person, hopefully sometime in you know, a year or two, we can do that. Uh, look for Null Island stickers and shirts and things like that just for fun. So that's what that refers to. Um, so a common global datum that you'll see in working with spatial data is one called WGS84. Um, guaranteed you've seen that as you're looking through the list of, of coordinate reference systems, especially if you work with like a, um, a graphical user interface like QGIS or, or ArcGIS. Um, so WGS84 is just a datum. Um, it's the shape of the Earth. So we can think of um, meeting out of myself, sorry. Um, so, um, but also datums, they don't have to just be global like WGS84, they can be local too. They can be fit to a specific area of the globe. Um, and in that case, uh, they fit well in a certain area and you could certainly use them for other parts of the world, but they don't fit well there. So you introduce a lot of distortion. So one example of that is uh, NAT83, which you probably also have seen um, when you're working with spatial data. Um, it's pretty common to see that one. That's a, a datum, North American datum, 1983. It was specifically fit for North America. 
So you could use it in other places, but on the other side of the globe, it may not be a great fit. There'll be more distortion than you probably want. So when you're looking at datums, make sure your datum is appropriate um, because that's, that's one way to go wrong is to have a, a datum that doesn't fit where you wanna go. Um, so when you just use a datum um, and you don't use any other part of that um, projected coordinate system, we just call that a geographic coordinate system. So things like lat long data um, are, they don't have a projected coordinate system, they have a geographic coordinate system. Um, so you'll see why later why that can be problematic when we're doing measurements and things like that. Um, but again, these have angular units. So they have like, you're familiar with degrees, right? From just plain old latitude and longitude. That's uh, actually degrees from that baseline. So when we talked about where is zero, zero, that's actually angular measurements north or south and then east or west from that zero, zero point, that baseline. Um, so to demystify what those numbers mean, that's what we're talking about. We're actually doing angular measurements. That's not distance measurements on the globe surface. It's actually angle from that origin with the center of your datum. Um, so you can I can't figure out a way to visualize this waving my hands around, <laughs> but just imagine um, there's some good uh, diagrams out there on the internet um, to help help you visualize that. Also, Bolstad has some really good images too, and I will refrain from flipping through the book and holding it up to the screen for you. Um, actually, the, the link that Naomi sent has all of the images in the book, so feel free to poke around there um, to get some. Okay, so in our orange peel analogy, the datum, um, you can think of it as the choice of fruit that you use to represent the earth. So in this case, I am choosing to use a mandarin. <laughs> you can see it's kind of squashy. So it probably only fits really well around the equator. I wouldn't use this datum for, for example, if I needed to work on the poles because it's sort of missing this uh, spot up here. It probably would not fit very well, but it looks like it would probably be really good for uh, either uh, an equatorial projection to use it that way, or if I used it in a transverse way, which means tip it sideways, um, you'll see that like you've heard of UTM, Universal Transverse Mercator. Uh, transverse just means tip it, um, di different angle. Okay, so <laughs> Fun times with orange peel analogy. So again, datum is kind of like picking your fruit for um, the shape of the earth. Um, you can think of other things like maybe I've got, you know, a nice navel orange that's really round or I've got a lemon that's kind of pointy on the ends. You can think, you know, this is going to fit really well in some places and maybe not in others. But, you know, maybe the navel orange is a good choice if I'm going to be representing a global datum. Okay, so again, pictures of citrus. This is necessary, it's part of the culture. Okay, um, so I have a note here um, to talk about this. One of the things that you should know is that working with different datums matters. <laughs> so you can have a projected coordinate system that otherwise looks the same, but it has a different datum. Um, so you could have California Albers with NAD 27, or you could have California Albers with NAD 83. And you might think, does it really matter? And the answer is it can. It can make a really big difference. The change in that datum can make a really big shift in where your points end up. Um, so pay attention to those things. The datum does matter. Um, so you want to make sure that you know which one you're using. Um, NAD 27 really isn't used that much anymore, but it's, it still shows up. So um, I think we're using it today, actually. Anyway, uh, so just pay attention to the datum. Um, I think datums are easy to overlook, but they really are important. Okay, so that's the datum part of the projected coordinate system. The next part of that is the projection itself. So the projection is the mathematical transformation from angular units. So we talked about how lat long are angles north, south, and east and west. Um, from that baseline, how we take those angular measurements and we're going to translate that into the flat surface, uh, such as a piece of paper or your computer screen, um, assuming you don't have one of those fancy curved ones. Um, the units for projections are typically linear. So they're often things like feet or meters, um, things where you can make a linear measurement as opposed to angular measurements like we have with our, our latitude and longitude measurements. Um, so oftentimes, people, I will even do this, people use the term projection when they mean coordinate reference system. Um, and that's fine. Uh, just, I don't really often hear people correcting each other, but um, 
just be aware of that, that the terms get used interchangeably, even though projection can refer to a very specific part of a coordinate reference system. I'm going to have a couple places where I talk to you about um, the linguistics of all of this, just because I think it's helpful to, to communicate. Um, so here's your orange peel analogy for, um, for the projection part of this. So if we're talking about our uh, orange, uh, how we actually peel this and flatten it out. So I'm going to see if I can, I picked one that I thought might peel well. So how I peel this orange, oh man, I'm doing a bad job of keeping this whole, we shall see. So get the stem out of there. Oops, hope that's not a problem. I just dropped the stem in the keyboard. So there we go. Okay, so I got my peel off, right? So this is my data, I'm gonna put this over here. Um, so my projected coordinate system um, or my projection part of the projected coordinate system is how I take this once round peel and how I flatten it out. So um, this is, I've got this part that came off like really curvy. In order to flatten this out, I'm either gonna to have to tear it or I'm gonna to have to smash it, right? And so if I, let's try smashing it. Ooh, it tore a little bit, but anyway, um, if you could see this in person and you've probably done this before, played with an orange peel, um, you know, you get like kind of wrinkly bits where I have to smash it. Um, and I'm not doing a great job of getting this flat. Um, all these places where we've had to smash things and tear things, these are places where we get distortions if we're thinking about how we're flattening out our coordinate reference system uh, from our curved surface. Okay, so hopefully that is helpful in terms of thinking about it. And we've got this handy picture here of someone having drawn a uh, set of uh, continents on an orange and flattening it out. Sorry, I'm just cleaning up orange bits off of my uh, uh, keyboard here. <laughs> so hopefully that was fun to see. Um, oh, somebody said you can't see me with the orange. Um, you will see it on the recording. And then also, if you look over at your, um, uh, at your window with the, um, oh, what do you call it? There's like a, a separate window in Zoom. Apologies if you couldn't see that. Um, bummer. But anyway, um, <laughs> so some people did see it. Um, again, it'll be on the recording. Um, folks watching the recording now are like, we can see it. It's in the corner. Um, but that's okay. Um, apologies if you didn't know that um, you can either set up the live by or side by side um, in Zoom or you can look at there's a, a you can look at the strip of speakers um, in the side. Sometimes I forget not all of us do Zoom all day because um, we use it like at UC Davis pretty frequently, but I realize other people may use other tools. So apologies for that. Um, but hopefully you can see the picture on the screen right now and imagine they did a much better job taking this picture and flattening it out. Uh, uh, but you can still see there's like places where there's like wrinkles and there's, um, you know, places where they've had to cut it. Um, looks like someone did it with a knife here. So it was a much better job than my smashy uh, torn up piece of uh, peel there. Okay, so that hopefully that analogy is helpful to think about like we're taking we're taking a round thing and we're trying to flatten it flat, flatten it out it's gonna have distortions so um, that's the key thing here, um, besides just being silly on the screen. Um, when you think about how to make that flat, it is hard, right? We can't get a flat thing that doesn't introduce distortions. Um, the same thing uh, applies when we're working with actual map data. Th those distortions are real and they need to be managed. And so that's why we're going to pick projections um, to minimize those distortions. Um, and we can visually think of it as all of those like tears and bumps and wrinkles in our, in our orange peel. Um, which we don't see in the actual map projection. The map projection looks all smooth and pretty on the screen. We don't see those um, because of the nature of what we're doing. So um, I think the orange peel analogy is just helpful for that. Um, okay, so we've been through two of the, the three pieces, right? We've talked about the datum, we've talked about the projection, um, and now we're gonna talk about the additional parameters. Um, these are things that, um, I think are also easily overlooked and we don't necessarily need to deal with them very often, but it's good to know that they're there. Um, so these are kind of the leftover bits of how we deal with uh, the math on doing the projection uh, that 
uh, you can kind of think of them if you do like um, a statistical model, it's kind of the like error part of this, like all the things that you need to tweak to make things fit um, really well. So um, oftentimes, uh, you know, your additional parameters could be things like moving the center of the map. I've done this before where we had um, some data with uh, data lab where the projection that we wanted to use was really good for um, kind of Southern California, Northern Mexico, um, but we just, our data was just outside of it. It was just a little bit more north than we wanted it. So I was actually able to use the additional parameters on a um, projection um, and move it slightly up uh, further north so that that center um, and the area of least distortion would fit our data. Um, so you can do that. You can actually use these additional parameters to make some tweaks to projections. Um, it's not very often that you need to do that, but it's nice to know that you can if you need to. Um, so you can think of those as just like extra things to make the projection fit better. And again, you won't necessarily need to, to work with those, but knowing that it's there is, is good. And, and you'll see that when we look at proj strings. All right, um, I'm going to pause for a second and see if we have any questions. Um, go ahead and put them in the chat window if you have questions or if um, it's easier to just describe it verbally, you can do that as well. But remember, we're recording, so um, that will get recorded. I'll give you guys a second to type. Um, I don't want to be too quick because I know typing takes uh, time in itself. Okay, so I'm not seeing any questions. I'll keep an eye on the chat though. If any occur to you, um, go ahead and put them there and we'll address those as, as we can. Okay, so um, next question. Now that we've kind of talked about some of the details of the projection, um, I will acknowledge there is a lot we did not talk about in terms of projections. Like we didn't talk about developable surfaces, what makes it a conic versus a tangent or all that stuff. Don't worry about that for today. Those are things you can get into more detail uh, later or um, you can learn about on your own. Come to drop in hours for data lab if you wanna talk more about that, I'm happy to talk more. Um, we just have a limited time today and you don't necessarily need to know that to work with projections in R and uh, with your spatial data. What we've talked about today should be enough to get you going in the right direction. Okay, so what projection should you use? There are hundreds, dozens, I don't know. There's a lot of projections out there. Um, so what, how do you pick one? Uh, how do you decide? Um, so a couple questions should you should think about um, when you're picking a projection. One is what is the area of minimal distortion that you need? So if I'm working, uh, I really commonly work with data in California. Maybe I just need a projection that fits California. Should be fine. Um, or if I'm working with global data, I need to find a projection that works well with global data and minimizes distortion over the entire surface of the globe. Um, so think about that. Where Where is your data? And then um, what area do you need to minimize distortion in? If it's super local, there may be a really local projection or maybe um, a more regional projection would, would be fine. So think about that. Um, and then what aspect of your measurements do you need to preserve? So coordinate reference systems can preserve things such as shape, area, distance, direction. Um, there may be a few other things that you can preserve. Um, in general, projected coordinate systems can't preserve more than two of those at any time. Uh, and most of the time they only preserve one. So that means if I need to, you know, say I have some, some spatial data and I need to make um, a distance measurement, let's say I have um, uh, polygons that are patches of habitat for an endangered species and I want to know the distance between each of the, those patches, I can do that measurement if I pick a projection that preserves distance. Now if I need to say also um, do a measurement for my study and I need to know how big are these patches. If my projection doesn't preserve both area and distance, I need to reproject my data and do my measurement with a projection that preserves area. So it could be that there's not one projection that you're going to use for all of your, your measurements for a study. You might need to switch projections in order to make sure that you not only have um, 
you know, projection fit for the area you're working with, but also that preserves the aspect of your data that you need to preserve. So don't be afraid to switch projections. Um, there's some good tools out there. I've got some links in the materials for today about uh, how to pick projections, things that help you visualize um, where projections are are suited to. Um, so go ahead and you know take a look at those. There's other tools too. I think there's some newer ones that have come out recently. Um, I'm also a big fan of um, if you work in QGIS, it will actually visualize. It gives you a little map and puts the bounding box for where the projection is applicable to, which is, is also handy. Um, so check out some of these tools that can help help you pick a projection. And, and don't be afraid to pick a projection that's like you've never heard of before. It's not a popularity contest. <laughs> you want to pick the projection that works with the things you need to, to work with. So if you're taking an area measurement, you need a projection that preserves area. Um, if you don't, say you make a, a, measure, uh, a measurement like area and you're doing it in let's say a geographic coordinate system, you just are doing on, on your lat long data. Um, the more, especially if you're just working in lat long and it's not projected, um, you're not preserving anything uh, because it's lat long um, without using a projected coordinate system. And then the further north and south you go, the more distorted those measurements are gonna get because um, plotting lat long on a Cartesian coordinate system really stretches things in the north-south direction. So like your area measurements will be very off and not in ways that you can adjust for. So you can't be like, oh, well, I know that it's gonna be like 20% bigger. That doesn't work that way. It's, it's not, um, you wouldn't be able to make those adjustments. You need to actually do the projection, the reprojecting to, to fix that. Um, so, uh, play around, look for, shop around for projections that work for your data and work for your needs for what you're trying to do. Um, you know, there's a lot of tools out there that can help. Um, and then, you know, ask around, look at, see what other people are using, but also be skeptical because people will often just pick like California Albers because it's California projection. I have California data. They may not stop and think, does this actually preserve the, the things that I need to preserve in my measurement? So, um, that's my stump speech about picking projections. It is okay to pick one that is uh, not uh, not super popular. <laughs> what does matter is you, you document it and you put that, if you're doing research, you want to put that in your study uh, to let people know what you're using. All right, um, so I want to pause for a second and see, do we have any questions about picking projections um, or anything else we've talked about so far? All right. So again, if this is a lot to talk about, especially if you're not um, super familiar with projections. So, you know, I always tell people you learn projections in layers. Um, so absorb what you can today and then come back to the materials um, and, and don't be afraid to think about projections and don't be afraid to ask questions. Um, definitely come see me in drop-in hours. We can always, you know, talk about these things more. Um, so I'm seeing uh, Andy posted in the chat a link uh, to an animation of different uh, projections. I love all these things. At the bottom of this workshop, there's a link to some fun projection stuff. So once your brain is all full of serious projection things, you can go um, take a look at that um, as well. Maybe we'll get Andy's uh, link in there if it's not already there. Okay, seeing a question, uh, does a projection matter for extracting raster values to point data? Um, for example, elevation from a DEM for plot locations? Yes. <laughs> so that's a great question. Um, we're gonna, we'll talk about, um, I added a section to this workshop that's new for raster data um, that we didn't have the last time I taught this. Um, so we can use projections for raster data as well as uh, vector data. And you would want to make sure that you use an appropriate projection. Um, so you'd want to think about what, what it is, what aspect you need to preserve to make that translation from uh, raster cells to points. But yes, you would want to make sure that things are projected in a a known coordinate system so that one is repeatable, but two, you're also minimizing distortions in the way that you want to. Uh, so great question. Okay, so a little couple more things before we get into the hands on part of today's workshop. Um, so some notation stuff. Um, this is more common. The two things we're going to talk about um, are more common when we're working with uh, 
things like R or um, any kind of programming environment, but you'll also see this in the graphical user interface tools as well. Um, those the the GUIs, the graphical user interfaces tend to use like a, a list where you can pick things off a list and see, you know, it all written out um, in human readable language. But um, they'll also you can use things like um, we're going to talk about EPSG codes and prod strings. Um, those can also be used in, in the graphical user interfaces if you're working there as well. So just um, FYI on on that, this this thing we're going to talk about next also applies to the graphical tools. Um, so two common ways to deal with how to communicate what projection you want to your computing environment is either EPSG codes or a uh, prod string. So first up, EPSG codes. Um, EPSG stands for, I had to write this out in the workshop because no one remembers, European Petroleum Survey Group. Um, this is a group of folks um, in Europe who decided that they needed to standardize projections. So they basically made a database um, of projections. They gave them all ID numbers, and then they standardized the, the parameters that we talked about earlier, all of the you know, datum and projection and, and other um, other parameters section, um, they standardized all that and gave them numbers. <laughs> so for example, uh, California Albers uh, is uh, 3310. Uh, because they work in California, have that memorized. Uh, you'll memorize all your favorites probably too. The idea is that this standardizes projections. So if I tell you I'm using 3310, you know you get the exact same parameters I'm using so that the data um, I'm using the data in the same projection you're using it in. It's standard, which is awesome because we like standardizing things for uh, reproducibility for research, but also just for sanity's sake with projections, which can make you a little bit uh, harried sometimes trying to, to sort all this stuff out. So standardization is good. Um, sometimes you'll actually hear people refer to the EPSG codes as an SRID, a spatial reference identifier. It means the same thing. So if you, um, especially if you work in PostGIS, you'll see it, it's referred to as an SRID, um, but you'll also see EPSG um, pretty commonly in R. So um, that's that's what we'll see today. Um, so again, the big advantage of this is standardization. The disadvantage to it is that you can't customize it. So if I'm telling you, and like in my example in the workshop materials that we're using uh, 27561, we can't change anything. Like if I needed to change where the baseline is of that, I can't. It's standard. Um, I get what I get. What comes in the box, and that's it. There's no messing with things. So EPSG codes are good for standardized projections. If we want to customize things, um, that's where prod strings come in. So again, a prod string is a standardized way of writing out parameters for a coordinate reference system. So I've got an example here on the screen in this kind of grayish color. Um, the nice thing about proj strings is that you can use them to sort of see what the parameters are um, at a glance. You might think that sounds a little bit detail oriented, I guess we'll say. Um, but the one thing that really I find helpful about proj strings is this section right here, where it tells me what the units are. So I don't have to go fishing around for it. If I can get the proj string, I can see what the units are right away. That's what I actually use them for the most in terms of reading them. Um, the rest of this is kind of a lot of numbers and parameters that I don't usually need to, to change, but I have when I need to. Um, the nice thing, though, about prod strings, aside from being able to like look under the hood and see what the parameters are, is that I can customize it if I need to. It's not super common that I need to, but occasionally I do, so um, that's when I would want to use a prod string. The big disadvantage of prod strings is the need to copy and paste. Um, it's really easy to accidentally leave off a section of this or quite frankly, put in extra things you don't need. Like if I'm copying and I accidentally get some extra words um, or if I don't realize I need to go down the line and, and um, forget this extra part that tells me some, some good information. So if you're working with prod strings, just make sure that you are copying and pasting everything and that you're not accidentally changing things. Um, so again, if your cat walks across the keyboard, you could totally change your location. Um, but prod strings are helpful. Um, so I have a note at the bottom of this section about some linguistics with this. Um, I 
some of this is written because I know people are using this as just written material. So some of the pronunciation guides are here because they won't hear me say it if they're just reading. Um, so prod rhymes with dodge, um, with the way people say it, um, in case you're wondering. Um, it's short for the word projection, and it comes from the, the proj library. Um, it's really common still to hear people refer to this library as Proj 4. Um, Proj 4 was the version 4 of this library that was in use for a really long time. So you'll still see people refer to it as Proj 4, even though I think we're on Proj 6 right now. Um, I, I still catch myself using it. Um, so just FYI, that's that's where all this like terminology is coming from. Um, so Proj library stands for projection, and it's just a way of writing out the projections in a standardized way. Um, so you can use this in R to define projections, which is why I'm telling you about it. And you'll see it in other places too, if you work with other things besides R. Okay, so this next section is probably, oh, I see I have a question, maybe I should stop. Um, no, I've already answered that one. Good. Any other questions while I'm looking at the chat? Okay. So then um, put them in there if you think of them. Uh, otherwise, I'm going to plow ahead. Um, so defining projections versus reprojecting. This is the biggest question people have. Um, I, I get questions about um, why is my data this is really common for California data to show up in Arizona. Um, <laughs> why is my California data in Arizona? Why is my data for, um, you know, Canada showing up near Antarctica? Um, these kinds of questions come up all the time. And a lot of times the answer is that people defined a projection when they meant to reproject. So um, I see I have a question in the chat. Uh, remind me, I will answer that when I finish the section because um, it's a good question. So. Um, we want to make sure that there there's two processes that we can do with respect to projections and data. We can define a projection, which is when um, if you work with spatial data, you've probably come across a situation, for example, where someone sends you a shape file and they forget to send you the PRJ file. It is gone for whatever reason. Maybe it just didn't make it through. They forgot to copy it. It's one of the downsides of shapefiles is having to keep all these little files together. So for whatever reason, you don't have the projection file. The data in the shapefile has a projection. The computer just doesn't know what it should be. In, in that situation, we're going to define the projection. We're going to tell the computer, whether it's R or whatever program, this is the projection to use. So um, that's defining a projection. On the flip side is reprojecting. Um, people get these confused. Let's say I, my data is in a projection. It it knows the computer knows what the projection should be, but I want it to be different. Then we need to go through a process that comes by different names. Um, some people call it reprojecting in R and PostGIS and other things like that. It, it's sometimes called transforming the data. Um, but whatever you're calling it, the idea is that we're doing a process where we're making a mathematical transformation from one projection to another. Um, so we don't want to use defined projection where we're like, well, I don't know what the projection is, but I want it to be in this projection. That will mess up your data. So we want to make sure that we are defining a projection when the computer needs to know what it is versus reprojecting or transforming when we need to make a switch between two projections. Um, so just be aware of that. Um, it, Unfortunately, the naming of these tools isn't standardized um, between all of the different things you can work with uh, spatial data and like all the different software. So just be aware of that. You always, if you have concerns or you're confused about what tool to use, read the documentation and it will tell you what it does. Um, or again, come to drop in hours and I'll, I can help you figure out what's the right tool to use. Um, so I see Pollock is asking, is there any catalog for the various proj strings? Yes, it is called the proj library. Um, so you can find that um, if you uh, look for that, it is actually a standardized list um, that you can use, but also the uh, proj uh, strings that we're using are standardized too. Um, I am going to look really quick at, um, I see Alex is on the call. Alex, do you have, I'm feeling like you probably have some thoughts about um, oh, here we go. Alex has a link for epsg.io. Thanks for the quick link on that. Um, 
I didn't want to spend time Googling while I'm doing a workshop, so I'm glad someone has those uh, ready to go. But yeah, so they, they're standardized. You can look them up online. Um, there are tools too that will actually um, help you understand like what each of these preserves and then also like what is the developable surface and things like that, all the nitty gritty details of, of projections too. So yeah, but standardizing projections is, is a big deal and it's a good thing. Um, okay, so that is the end of our concept section. Um, I'm, I think we're ready to move on to the hands on part. Um, I'm going to move pretty quickly through that just because we've added some more concepts and hopefully we can get through everything. So another question, what if I get a raster from someone without a proj string? Um, same deal, you're going to, um, so if you get any data, whether it's raster or vector, and it doesn't have um, the projection information, like if you get like a um, some of the some of the raster data, for example, needs like a world file. Um, if that doesn't come with it, um, then you would want to do a process of defining your projection to regenerate that file. Um, so that's a situation where we want to define the projection, not reproject. So good question. Do you have any other questions before we move on to the hands on portion of today? Okay, well, I'll give you a second while I transition. Um, going to move some things around on my screen, hopefully. So as you, if you're watching the, um, the video of, of me, the presenter, um, and you see me looking to the side, it's because I have two screens. So um, I'm showing you the one screen, but I have helping material on the other one. Um, so that's just what's going on that there. Um, let me, I'm going to move around. You probably don't see it except maybe a little shadow box. Um, moving around my Zoom controls so that they're not in my way. I <laughs> find when you do any kind of spatial workshop, um, the Zoom tools are always in the way. Okay, so I don't see any more questions in the chat. So um, we will move along with the materials for today. Um, so ignore the stuff. My, my, um, our thing is messy, but we'll get started in a second. Um, okay, getting ahead of myself. Okay, so we just finished the concept section of the materials that I've been showing you. Um, so I'm going to click down here to section two uh, for the tutorial with R. Um, I'm going to transition this off the screen. I'm going to read from it um, so you can follow along and um, I might bring it back to show you where we're at occasionally, but just know I'm going to be following the, these materials pretty closely. So if you need a visual reference or you want to follow along with the words um, that's available to you um, in the link that I, I shared at the beginning of the workshop. Um, okay, so we are going to be doing some hands on stuff with R. Um, so today, we, um, it's amazing. Once you rewrite a workshop, you find all the things you missed right as soon as you put them up on the screen. Ignore the section about uh, SP. We're actually going to be working with uh, um, with SF today. Um, we, I rewrote the workshop for that. So ignore that section. I'll get that fixed and switched out um, for uh, the future, probably later today. Okay, so um, we are going to be working with um, some data from a box file. I will post the link to that again. Let me just grab the link for you um, on the other screen. That's where I put that. So I'm going to post the link again to the materials and to where you can download uh, the data for today. And the data link is also in the in the workshop materials. Um, okay, so we're going to start by um, downloading the data. Um, I'm going to give you guys a second to get that. Sorry. <laughs> I have a ton of things going on like on the <laughs> side screen. Uh, when you do a workshop, sometimes that happens. I'm just filtering through that in my brain. Um, so go ahead and, and download the data. Um, if you could, in your Zoom tools, there's uh, participant tools, which um, I'm indicating on my screen, and I'm pretty sure you can't see. Um, there should be an option in there to, um, so I'm going to stop sharing really quick so I can tell you what this is. Um, 
Okay. They have changed things yet again on me. Where did they put it? Okay, in the reactions, that's what we're looking for. So if you go down on your, uh, to the bottom of your screen in your Zoom, uh, there's reactions tab uh, or button, I guess. If you can take a look at that, when you have, when you've downloaded your data and you're ready to go, go ahead and click the yes button for me. Uh, it's a little green check mark. Um, when you're ready to go, go ahead and click that. That way it can see how many of you are ready to move on. It doesn't stick around for long, so I may pull you again in a second. <laughs> and if anybody, if anyone is still waiting to uh, finish your download, go ahead and click the no button for me, or um, is it no? It's the, the red button. Yeah, it's called no. So if you're not ready, go ahead and click no for me so that I know to wait. All right, I'm not seeing any no's coming up. So I'm going to go ahead and, and start shifting towards, um, I'm going to start sharing my screen again, and then I'm going to pick up the, the workshop materials. Okay, sharing that screen. This is my R window. Okay, so um, it sounds like pretty much everyone that wants to download the data has, or they're confident that's going to finish soon, which is fine. Um, so we will go ahead and move on. All right, so we are going to be working in our studio today. Um, I'm going to demo that, but obviously, like you can work in whatever makes you happy. If you want to work in just plain R or you have some other environment, that's fine. Uh, but I'm going to demo um, our studio today. So I've opened up our studio. I've already got that up on the screen. Um, I've got junk on mine. Um, I didn't clear it out because Again, I mentioned earlier that uh, today's been a little bit rough. So um, ignore that. I'll get you a new uh, script in just a second. So we're going to start up R. Um, and then what I'm going to do is I'm going to click on my plus button up here in the, the corner of my screen and I'm going to pick a new R script. Um, there's other ways to get to this, but um, I find this one to be the easiest. So that's what we're going to do. So a little plus button and then new R script. I'm just going to move mine over. Um, again, if you're, if you're not working on 500 different R scripts, you <laughs> probably have a cleaner interface than me um, and that is okay. Um, okay, so the first thing we're going to do is we are going to install some libraries. Um, and you can see if you're following along in our workshop materials that is ready for you there. So um, we need to do two libraries. So if you have not already installed these, um, we'll do some installing really quick. Um, so ah. I like to comment my code a lot. So I may do this as we go along just to keep my brain sorted. Um, so, okay, we're dealing with libraries. I need to install something. So I'm gonna use install.packages. Um, and I want, the first one we're gonna be working with is SF. So again, the, the part of the materials that said we're working with um, the older library SP, we're not doing that today. We're actually gonna work with SF. So normally you'd run that. I'm not gonna run mine because I just installed it and I don't wanna break anything for me today. Um, but you should run it if you have not installed SF before. Um, the other one we're going to need, so install.packages again, um, we are going to use Terra, which is a new uh, package that is similar to raster that was written by Robert Hymans as well. Um, so that's going to be for the raster data. So SF works well for um, vector data, Terra is good for uh, raster data, um, and hopefully we'll get to the raster section of this. Originally this workshop didn't have the um, the raster section, but I added it. So hopefully we'll have time. If not, it's all in the materials and it's, it's pretty straightforward. Okay, so we've installed our packages, um, both SF and Terra. Um, and now this is what I always forget when I install a new package that I still have to load it. Like I can install it and not load it and then I will not have the things that I need. So um, we're gonna use library and we want to have SF. And I know we can put these on like group them together, but I like to keep them separate because sometimes I need to just turn stuff on and off and this just makes it easier for me. So it doesn't matter if you put them together or not. Um, that's just, you know, personal preference. So now I'm going to run my line. So library SF to, uh, to turn on my library for SF and then also the next line to turn on my tarot library as well. And you can see that it's got um, some warning messages and, you know, the red text is kind of scary, but you read through those and um, 
these are all normal for, for these packages, so I'm not going to be worried about any of those, um, basically telling me that they were built under a different version of R than I'm using. But that's okay, because uh, hopefully they will continue to work because they did earlier. Okay, so the next thing I want to do, um, so we've loaded our libraries. Now we have um, all the, the tools available to us in those libraries that we want to use. So the next thing I want to do is, um, oops, I need to put my cursor in the actual R. Um, <laughs> it's a constant battle for me. All right, so the next thing I want to do is just do some setup. Um, I want to set my working directory to where I have my workshop data. Um, so you can see in the workshop materials, I have um, just a suggested um, path, uh, which is not the one I'm actually going to need to use on my computer. You're going to need to swap out that path for where you saved your data. So I'm going to grab the material. So I'm going to, oops. Let me type this out first. So we're going to use the setwd to set our working directory. And then inside setwd, we need to give it the path to where we store our data. Um, so wherever you put your data, you'll need to go find that. Um, in my case, I have my data in this folder. So I have, I have a D drive on my computer. Um, I have a folder called uh, workshop data. And then I have it in this folder called prep projections. Um, Normally I'd swap that out for something that's a little bit cleaner for workshops, but um, this will work for today. Um, so again, you'll, you'll need to figure out where you stored your data. Um, sometimes I like to put my data in a really simple directory, like um, on my D drive without a lot of um, a lot of folders, just when I'm working with R, because then it makes the paths a little bit easier, but then sometimes I have giant ones and I just have to deal with it. Um, so, okay, so we've got our set working directory and our path to our actual folder. Um, so I'm going to assume, I'm going to click run on this um, to set that working directory and make sure it worked. Um, I'm going to assume in my paths that I'm giving you, that I'm going to show you, is that I have this workshop folder and then within that workshop folder there is a folder called data where I'm storing my data. You don't need to have your setup the same way, but you do need to know how to reference it. Um, so um, that's why you'll see later when we load data, it's in a folder called data and then slash and then the, the workshop uh, uh, files the data. Um, so don't, don't get hung up on that. Just know where your data is and then refer to it in the folders that you have set up um, or you can use my setup as well. Um, okay, so that being said, the next thing we need to do is load our data. Um, all of the other stuff is, Great, but it's much more fun to play with data. So let's load some data. Um, so we're gonna be working with, um, uh, let's see, the data I have for you today is from the San Francisco area. So it's um, San Francisco Bay watershed and the San Francisco Peninsula. Um, so you'll see when we load the data, I'm gonna call things, uh, my data I'm going to call WS dot and then something. WS in this case for me stands for watershed. So we're working with watershed data. Um, and that was a way in my brain to name it. So I knew what it was. Obviously, you can name stuff whatever you like. Um, but that's that's sort of my thinking on this. And I just want to give you a little insight into my brain. OK, so the first things that we want to load. Um, so I'm going to use, again, WS for watershed points. Um, because these are my points inside my watershed, um, and that's what I'm going to call it. Um, and so we're going to use the function stread. Um, that reads our data in, and it takes, um, <clears throat> it can take multiple arguments. So the one that is 100% necessary is the path to where our data is. Um, so I have mine in my data folder, and then I'm going to copy and paste in the name of the data. And you can, again, you can copy and paste from the workshop materials. I just know if I try to write out the file name on this, I'm going to mess it up. So copy and pasting is my friend in this case. Okay, so I've got, I've got my, uh, my variable that I'm calling WS points for watershed points. I'm reading in the data with ST read and I'm giving it the path to where my GeoJSON file is. Um, GeoJSON is a vector format that is one file, which makes it really nice for teaching workshops. It's also human readable. Um, it's not great for processing, but it's a really good storage format. Okay, so I'm gonna run that and you can see that it, um, R in my console has given me some messages about it like, Look, it's a point data set and look, it has a projection. Yay. That's what we're here for today is a projection. So you can notice that um, the 
return on this is just going to give us a little bit of information. Um, and if I care about projections, um, which obviously in this workshop we really do, um, this piece of information down here for the projected coordinate system is really, really helpful to know. It's also nice if you're working and you see that and you're like, wait, it should have a projection. Why doesn't it? Okay, so we're going to load some more data. Um, so again, watershed, in this case, I want polygons. So I'm going to call it polygons, and then I'm going to load my polygon data. So same deal. We've got st underscore read, and then we're going to give it our path uh, to our data. So again, I have my data inside my data folder in the working directory I set, and then I'm going to copy and paste in my file name, which is also in your workshop materials. So they get that right. So we've got my workshop polygons or watershed polygons. And again, I clicked load. And if you blinked, you missed it. It put a new set of uh, output here in the bottom. And again, it told me my, my projected coordinate system is NAT 83 California Albers. So remember datum and then projected coordinate system. So cool, they match right now. I've got two data sets, same projection. Um, you may, uh, maybe guessing that that isn't going to last because it's a projection workshop and we have to break something. All right, so I'm going to have one more set of data, watershed, and I'm going to load in streams. Um, so I'm calling, I'm making a new one, calling it WS streams for watershed streams. And again, reading the data in with ST read. If you learned nothing else today, it is how to read data in. <laughs> uh, hopefully some other projection things. So the last thing is um, flow lines at SHP. Um, so I've got my, this is uh, from the NHD data set, if you're familiar with that too. So that's why it's called flow lines. Um, that's our stream data set. So I'm gonna click run. All right, so as you may have guessed, um, I set this up to break uh, so that we have something to do in the workshop. Um, so our notice our CRS output in our console says the CRS is not applicable. Oh dear, um, how did that happen? Somebody lost the PRJ file in the for the projection. Um, I will confess that I renamed it to um, to make it break for this workshop. So you actually do have the PRJ file, and if you make it set um, to be flowlines.prj, it will work again. Um, didn't want to leave you without it, but I needed it to break for the workshop. So anyway, we broke it so that you could play with it and fix it. Um, okay, so now we have all of our data loaded. Um, and your materials, I'm just scrolling down in the materials, make sure that I got everything so far. Okay, so um, if I wanna just inspect one of these items, what I can do is if I wanna say, look at our polygons, I can just type into the um, console or I can type in our code here um, to read more about it. Let's look at our I think I want to look at polygons. So R is helpfully giving me suggestions. And if I click tab, it will accept those. And so I'm going to um, do control enter just to run that line of code. So we can take a look at what this polygon data looks like. So if you're familiar with uh, you know, data frames in R, this looks very similar to a data frame. Um, we've got columns for our attribute table because this is uh, vector data. So these are polygons for watershed boundaries in this case. And we've got some information about like, what's the name of it? Um, what uh, HUC 8 identifier it has, um, if you work with uh, watershed information or the um, NHD data, that's familiar. If not, don't worry about it. Just think of it as polygons that have some ID number. Um, and then we have this extra special column here that is called geometry. And you can see it says multi-polygon. And then if we were to look at the whole thing, it would show us a whole bunch of um, coordinates in our projected coordinate system units. Um, so this is meters from the baseline in this case. That's why it doesn't look like lat long because it's in a different coordinate system. But anyway, so that's what it looks like sort of under the hood. Um, not super scary different from what you're familiar with if you just work with non-spatial data so far. Um, but that extra geometry column is really the key to holding our spatial data. Okay, so pretty straightforward so far. Um, the next thing I want to do is look at our um, coordinate reference system. So um, look at CRS, just for my brain to remind me what we're doing. So all of the different spatial uh, libraries in R have different ways of 
like naming these different functions. Um, you'll see when we look at Terra that it has a similar concept, but it, it refers to it in a different way. Um, so with um, SF, we're going to use STCRS, the function, and then we just need to pass it the name of our file. So WS points gets our point data. So I'm going to control enter to run that. And so it gives us some information about our coordinate reference system. Um, so we already saw this when we did our um, input. It told us what it was, um, but that's fine because we can get some more details. Um, a lot of this, um, this is well-known text here. It's a different way of, of showing projections, but it looks kind of similar to the, the proj strings we looked at earlier. So anyway, um, and then here, uh, the ID number, it recognized this as a specific EPSG code. Um, remember, we didn't tell it that. It, it already knew that. It looked through and, and found that. So um, it tells us EPSG code 3310, which is California Albers. Um, similarly, if we do the same function and we ask for STCRS of our watershed uh, polygons, then if we run that line of code, we'll see we get similar output. Um, in fact, it looks really similar because it's the exact same projection. Um, and that was by design, obviously, for this workshop. However, as you may guess, if we do the same thing, give myself some space here, do st underscore crs, and we do ws streams. Oh no, it doesn't have a coordinate reference system, which we knew because we saw that when we um, inputted our data, when we read it in, but in case we missed it or something happened, like when I was writing this workshop, I had to troubleshoot, I screwed something up and I had things all jumbled up. STCRS was my friend because I need to make sure it looked right for the workshop. Um, so even people who are giving workshops can get scrambled about uh, projections sometimes. Okay, so we have um, our streams data and it doesn't have a projection. So we need to actually set our projection because um, again, this is the situation where it's lost a projection. Um, it doesn't it, the data has a projection, but the computer can't read it because somehow we lost our PRJ file for a shape file. So we need to define it. Um, so we don't get to decide, like, if I wanted to pick a projection, I would say, let's make it 3310 California Albers NAT 83, right? Everything else is in that. However, if I was to do that, I would be misdefining the projection because the streams data is actually in California Albers NAT 83. So it has a different, um, it has a different datum. And remember, we talked about how that can make a difference. If you actually plot them one on top of each other um, after we're done doing a reproject, you'll see they shift a little bit. It's not super off in this case, but it can be, and it can be enough to make your measurements wrong. Um, so we want to make sure that we define it properly and then we'll reproject it. So let's go ahead and let's set um, our projection for our streams um, using the right projection. So we're going to define CRS. Okay, so um, how we do that is we can use a function called stsetCRS. Now I could just say like make my streams data have this projection, but I like to be a little bit more explicit about this so that I don't um, forget what I'm doing. Um, always leave yourself breadcrumbs. So I'm going to use uh, WS streams for the name, but I'm going to add something to the end. In this case, I'm going to add 3309. That is the EPSG code for our new data. Um, so I'm going to do a define projection process, and I want to make sure that I'm using the one with a projection that I know. So I'm going to call it uh, streams and then 3309. Um, I actually do this when I save files too. If it's the same data and I have a different projection, I'll actually add onto the end of the file name EPSG and then the, the code number um, if it has an EPSG code. Just keeps things a little cleaner. Okay, so we want the function st set underscore CRS, in this case for SF. Um, so this is going to set the projection. It's defining the projection. We're only telling it what it should be. So it needs the input for our streams data. Oops, streams with an S. Uh, oh my goodness, I'm just going to pick it off the list so I spell it right. <laughs> Um, so it needs to know what, what we want to define the projection as. Um, and then we need to tell it, in this case, it takes this parameter value. And we can tell it, um, value can take a couple different arguments, but in this case, we're lucky because it can just take the EPSG code value. So we give it um, the numeric code and it, it knows that that is an EPSG code. Um, and that's for California Albers with NAD 27. So I'm gonna run this. So we've set our 
um, didn't throw an error, no, no fireworks, nothing exciting happened, but we've now made this new item that is our streams data with uh, the EPSG code 3309 for our projection. Okay, so now we've set it. It now has the correct projection, but it needs to play nice with the other data, so now we have to change it, right? Um, so we could go through and we could check all of our CRSs again, which I think is what we do in the workshop materials, but um, well, maybe it doesn't, it's in my notes, but that's okay. Um, we don't need to do that because we know what they are. Okay, so now we want to transform our data um, and put it in a projection that we want to actually use. Okay, so um, there's a couple different ways we can do it. Um, so I'm going to transform data. That way I've got my comments there and I know what I'm doing. Okay, so we can do, um, a couple different options and I'll show you what these are. Um, it depends on what information you have, which one you want to use. Um, so, so I'm going to uh, name my new data set um, watershed streams and then um, in this case I am going to give it 3310 at the end uh, because that's the EPSG code for the new uh, projection I'm going to use. All right, so then we want to use, in order to transform the data, we're going to use this function sttransform. Um, and that is, this is uh, transforming the data or reprojecting the data, depending on which vernacular you're familiar with. But we're taking, we have a projection and we want to give it a new one. We want to put it into a different projection. I want to be really explicit about this, the difference between defining and transforming or reprojecting, um, because that's where people have the most trouble. Okay, so ST transform needs the data that we want to transform. So in this case, I want to make sure I use our watershed streams 3309 because that one has a defined projection. It has to already have a projection in order to do this. All right, and then we get, in this case, it wants to know our, what our CRS is. Um, so we're going to tell it we want to use 3310 because again, CRS, this argument takes, it can take a um, an EPSG code. All right, so we're going to run that line and then it will, again, no fanfare, it just did it. Um, we could go back and look, but that's, I'm going to trust it in this case. Um, there's another way that you can do this. Um, let's say I wanted to make sure, um, maybe I didn't have, um, okay, Alex is pointing out that, um, okay, I need to go back and look at the, the chat. So, um, Couple questions. Do the two different California Albers projections have different EPSG numbers? Yes. So 3310 is um, California Albers with NAD83 as the datum and 3309, so one, one before it is uh, with the datum uh, for NAD27. So they do have different numbers um, and that's, that's one of the features of the EPSG code system. Um, and Jan is having some errors, which I think Alex is helping with. Um, Okay, so um, I'm guessing, Jan, we're, um, so Alex points out that um, if you're getting the NA still for the CRS after you define the projection, if you're following along with my code, we didn't actually change the projection for um, the watershed streams. We made a new variable that was watershed streams 3309. So if, if you have the same code that I've got, then it should actually have changed your projection. So just, I, I like to, um, the reason I'm doing it that way is so that it's kind of leaving breadcrumbs for my own brain. So I know that I've actually changed the projection. You could just overwrite it and you could define it and say watershed streams is going to have this projection and that's totally fine. Um, a lot of coding is is really catering to your own brain and how it works. So I'm just <laughs> sort of letting you into the, the intricacies of my brain and how I code. Um, so take, take what of that is helpful and then continue on with how you code too um, and that that's totally fine. Um, just some differences in the way, you know, habits and the way brains work and things like that. So, but thank you for bringing it up because other people may have had that same question. Okay, so I was showing you one more way to do this, essentially the same um, process of doing the ST transform, but um, if we wanted to say, not worry about what the what the projection is at all. If I just want to set my projection to match one of the other data sets, I'm just going to run this. I'm going to 
overwrite my variable here because they're going to do the same thing. Um, so again, I'm going to add the 3310 on the end because I, I know that's what the output is going to be on this. So ST transform, same deal. Um, and then I'm going to have my watershed streams 3309. Um, and then for the CRS argument on here, though, um, I'm going to use STCRS uh, to get the CRS, just like we did before, um, of one of our existing data sets. So let's say I wanted to match my polygons. I can just say, OK, our go get me the CRS from polygons. And it will match that. So if I run that, we'll get the same. It'll be the exact same thing because it has uh, 3310 as its projection. But anyway, so you can, there's multiple ways to, to get the CRS and put it in there. I just wanted to show you. Um, you'll see that sometimes and if you're looking at Stack Exchange. Uh, so this way, everybody matches. Um, let's see. So I'm going to skip going through and looking at all of our projections again, but that's what the workshop materials do. See another thing I need to fix here that should be for the the new streams data, um, but that's okay. I'm pointing to things you can't see on the screen. <laughs> so I called the wrong layer when I was checking the projections in one of the sections, and I'll get that fixed um, because we did already fix the projection. So if we look at um, really quick, just to prove my point, um, if we look at STCRS uh, for watershed streams, thirty-three ten. Oops, put that back up there. I'm going to keep doing the same thing until I get it right. Um, so if I run that, then we can see that it is uh, it has the right projection on that. Uh, this particular um, watershed st streams 3310 has the right projection that we want. OK, so now the cool thing is now we have our three data sets. And because they have the same projection and we define them properly and we transform the one that didn't match, all of our data can play nicely together. We could actually plot this. Um, so what I want to do really quick is read in a file just for some background data. Uh, so I'm going to get my county's data, which is in your data set um, from your download. So I'm going to call it ca.counties. I'm going to load in this shape file so we can do a little fun plotting. Um, so you use stread just like before. I've got stuff in my data folder. And this one is called ca counties I should copy and paste can't spell uh, okay so we've got ca counties.geojson so I'm going to run that um, and that should load yes it did <laughs> it paused there for a second it scared me like it wasn't right um, okay so we've loaded in our California counties this is just so we can have some background data for plotting um, so if I want to build a plot um, just so we can see everything together just because it's fun to actually see things, it's spatial. Um, so I'm going to use the plot command. I'm using base plot here um, to make some really rough maps. There are a lot of good um, plotting um, libraries out there that make much better looking maps. But um, I find with workshops, the more um, the more libraries we have to load, the more things there are to break and dependencies that could potentially go wrong. So we're going to use base plot here. But by all means, if you're going to make maps, do it in something that's better for making maps than, than base plot. Um, also, come to the workshop in a couple of weeks and we'll talk about how to refine them a little bit more uh, too. OK, so I want to plot my first thing I want to do is plot my counties. And then with these SF objects um, to get it to plot just the shape, I want to have it plot the geometry um, in the workshop materials. I have a lot of different parameters that I put in here to make um, some pretty maps, at least so that they're um, not quite so weird looking, but I think in the interest of time, I'll just go ahead and do a really rough plot so that we get time to go to the raster stuff. Um, so if you want to copy and paste the the pretty uh, prettier map out of uh, the workshop materials, you can do that. So I'm going to start by just plotting our counties. Oh, the one thing I do need is our bounding box. I'm going to copy and paste that in. So if I plot this just right now, it will have um, It'll zoom out to the entire extent. What I want to do is put in some bounding box information. So if you're familiar with just base plot, you know you have this x limb and y limb for the x and y limit on 
your plotting window. Um, so in this case, because we're using SF objects, it can take an object called uh, ST B box, uh, which stands for bounding box. So basically what I'm doing is I'm getting the bounding box from my polygon data and making it so that it plots for the size of the polygon data. But at first thing I'm going to do is plot the counties. Um, get rid of the extra comma there and let's run this and then it'll make more sense. There it goes. Okay, so let me zoom real quick and make this bigger. So you can see I've got this is if you're familiar with California. Um, this should look like sort of the Bay Area counties, but I didn't want to plot all of California because we're just going to be working with data in this area. So I just limited the bounding box on that. All right. Um, so we're going to add to this. Um, the nice thing is with plot, we can use the add equals true parameter and kind of pile things up on top of each other. All right. So plot, I'm going to add in my watershed streams. In this case, though, with streams, we want to make sure we pick the 3310 one, right? Because it has the right projection. If we do the other one, it um, it will plot, but it will actually be off. Um, it won't look off, but it will be, and that would be a problem. Um, uh, but I also want to back up and tell it to use the geometry part of our data set so it doesn't just print everything all over the place. Um, in this case, I want to give it a color. Um, let's just uh, ask for dark blue. I think that should work. Um, and then finally, we want add equals true. So this is a little different than the workshop materials, but that's OK. There we go. OK, so it plotted. <laughs> it looks like blue freckles. That's OK. Um, so we've added our streams now on top of our counties, so we can see where our stream data was. Um, then I want to add in a couple more things. So I'm going to plot uh, watershed points. Actually, let's leave that out. Let's just do let's just do our polygons. The watershed points are just the centroids of the the watershed, so they're not super interesting for for plotting. So I'm just going to leave those out. So I'm going to add I'm just going to add a line weight parameter here to make them a little bit more bold, so they don't look just like the counties. Um, I'm going to give them a border parameter and tell them to be. Uh, gray 35, which is just a standard color in R. And then finally, add equals true. Equals, there we go, true. I'm going to run that, and then we should see that it will plot. Um, give it a second. Um, let me make this bigger. <laughs> it makes it smaller. So helpful, R. OK, so there's our plot. Um, again, nothing fancy. This is not a beautiful map, but you can see the um, watershed boundaries are kind of this fat gray line around it. Um, just to prove that we can plot them together. Again, I would not publish this map. This is not attractive. I would definitely spend a lot more time fussing with this and making it look better. But that's the point of this is we've had data that would not plot together before correctly. And now we've worked with the coordinate reference system to make everything match correctly using the right process. And now we can put it on our map. And then we can move on to fixing things and making it look good. OK, so that was the vector part of this. What I'd like to do is move on to the raster part in the last bit. Um, do we have any more questions about working with the vector data or the process so far? All right, so quick preview of the raster section. Um, our raster section is going to be pretty similar to what we just did um, in terms of um, looking at the processes that we would use with um, defining projections with raster data. The big difference is that we have we're going to use a different package in the uh, for this. In this case, we're going to use Terra. Um, raster is pretty similar if you wanted to use the raster package, but um, Terra is new. So I thought, let's let's go ahead and use Terra for this. Um, OK, so don't see any questions in the box. So let's move on, make myself some room here. Uh, so we're going to start working with our raster data. All right. OK, so um, in your data folder, you have a raster that's called DEM underscore SF um, dot TIFF. What this is is a digital elevation model of the city of San Francisco. Um, um, OK, so I'm seeing a question from Tara um, that she accidentally loaded the um, the streams with the other projection, but it looked OK. Yeah, so I thought about this um, 
sort of at the last minute that I probably should have given you a different projection that would make a really big difference. Um, on a local scale, it will be off. Um, it doesn't look that much different, unfortunately, for um, for this because we just changed the datums and they're not that much different. Um, but if it was a different one, it would make a big difference. And again, like if you're trying to do measurements on those and you pick the wrong one, um, a lot of our, our packages will actually throw an error if they don't match. It will say, you know, this doesn't work. Um, other things are less forgiving and will play along and then give you nonsense. Um, so you do wanna make sure that it, it it does match when you're doing um, calculations and things like that. But for the, unfortunately for the plotting, it, it really doesn't look that much different. So that's a good question. Um, I guess if I uh, rewrite this one again, I should make the projections really different so that they like plot in Arizona or something <laughs> so they don't show up. Uh, but that's a really good question to ask. Are there any other questions before I get going on the raster stuff? This group has really good questions. So ask, ask them, everyone will learn. Okay, so I'm gonna I'm move on and if I see questions pop up, I'll stop and answer them. All right, so um, raster data. Again, so we're gonna be working with a, a DEM, a digital elevation model for the city of San Francisco. Um, all of this data, um, this particular data set came from the city of San Francisco's um, repository. Um, so you can, I think I clipped it down from something they had, but anyway, uh, if you're interested, they've got a really good data set. If you need data to play with, um, I recommend going over there. Um, so what I want to do is starting by reading my data. So um, I'm just going to call it DEM. As you probably have guessed later, I may augment that. Um, oh, I see Alex is adding in the chat um, the comment that they're only the difference between the two projections I had you working with between the NAD27 and the NAD83 for the datums are only about uh, 90 meters. Um, so yeah, it would be hard to see, but it is different. Um, one time when I loaded them and I accidentally loaded the wrong one and I did a quick switch, you could, it moved like a little bit. <laughs> um, again, I probably, next time I rewrite this, I'll, I'll pick a different projection that's way different. Okay, sorry. Um, but good questions, good explanations in the chat. So um, what I wanna do is load in my raster data. So I've got, I'm gonna make a new variable called DEM for digital elevation model. Um, and I'm going to use, in this case, uh, for Terra, the um, Terra package, we're going to use the rast function to load in our raster. Um, so it wants parameter x, and x needs to be the path to where we stored our data. So in my case, it's in the data folder, um, and the file is called dem underscore sf dot tiff. So I'm going to run that line, and it should, oh, bummer. I need to find my data. Um, so let me, I think what happened is it's not in the folder that I was in. Let me just move some data. Um, so quick pause while I move my data over. Um, and you guys, if you have questions, go ahead and put them in the chat. Uh, I'm just gonna find where I put this data and fix it. Oh, did I put too many Fs? Thank you. Let's try that. I was like, I swear I had the data. That worked. Thank you, Naomi. <laughs> uh, so and just in case you thought people who know, like do this stuff on a regular basis, don't make these kinds of mistakes. We all do. Um, and if Naomi hadn't helped me, it might have taken me a while to fix that. <laughs> I actually had some days where I spent a lot of time yelling at R. Um, OK, I, I appreciate the fix on that. Thanks. OK, so. Um, We've loaded in our data successfully. Hopefully now you have as well and you didn't put too many Fs in your file name. This is why copying and pasting is good for me um, because then I don't make spelling errors. Um, so the first thing I wanna do is find out what is the CRS of this. So I'm gonna use the CRS command. This is the Terra way to ask for what the CRS is. Um, nobody has standardized how to ask for these things or what these functions should be called. So you just kind of have to look at the documentation to find out what the options are. Um, so in this case, uh, the CRS function wants to know what data we want to ask it about. And so um, we're just gonna put DEM in for the argument and then run that. Try that again. <laughs> Control enter makes it go, not shift. <laughs> okay, so um, looking at the output, we've got um, this looks pretty similar to what we saw with um, with the SF package, but slightly different way of formatting the output. But um, 
what I'm most interested in this is this end part where it tells me the EPSG code is 4269. Okay, so that's good to know. It came with a projection. Um, with the raster data, if um, this one has a projection, I didn't strip it out um, just because I think you get the idea. But if I needed to define it, um, uh, so if I wanted to define the CRS, I'll just define it with the actual projection that it has, just so you can see what this looks like for Terra. Um, so in this case, I would use the CRS function for the uh, DEM data. And I could assign this to a new variable, but in this case, I'm not going to. Um, and the way we do it with Terra is EPSG uh, colon, and then the projection. Again, we're defining the projection here. We're telling it what it should be. It knows what it should be, but we're just going to be extra safe and tell it to be the right one anyway. So I want 4269. If I mistype here, I'm going to define the projection incorrectly. So I'm going to be really careful and make sure I do that right, because otherwise nothing else will work today. Um, OK, so I'm going to basically I'm assigning the projection to be. Oh, my goodness. Apparently, this is not going to work. I'm going to copy and paste and see if this is any different. Pardon me. I, I misspelled something, huh? <laughs> I did transpose numbers. Thank you, Naomi. Naomi is my uh, spell checking angel today. <laughs> Thank you. Okay, that worked. Um, so again, this is why I told you one of the one of the challenges with uh, proj strings is um, typing things out. Like you can easily make a mistake. The same thing with just me and typing in general. So if I can copy and paste, I'm going to. It just makes my life easier. Um, so again, uh, my my problem here was that I had switched some. Uh, letters typing. So it should be EPSG um, and then the number. Okay, so that's how we define a projection with Terra. So I have a raster, maybe it doesn't have a projection. Um, I need to tell the computer what it should be. This is how I'm going to do it with Terra. If I want to reproject it um, and or transform the projection and put it into something else, like let's say we want to put it into uh, California Albers uh, EPSG code 3310 to match the other data. Um, so if I want to transform my CRS, um, I'm going to do that in a different way, right? Like I don't want to just change the definition because that will break things. I'm going to want to use the tool that does the actual reprojecting. So again, I'm going to name it um, my DEM, but I want to add 3310 at the end just for my knowledge. You could call it whatever you want. Um, in this case, uh, Terra has its own version of naming the function, so it's calling it project. Um, it needs the argument for what do I want to project, uh, in this case, my DEM data, and EPSG uh, 3310 tells it what I want the new projection to be. So if I run that, I'm reprojecting the data. I'm transforming it into the new projection. So now I have a raster that has the EPSG code for its projection for 3310, which matches all of our other data. So um, the nice thing is if I want to plot everything together, I can. So um, what I want to do now is just do, again, some quick plotting to show now that everything overlays. So if I have my DEM of 3310, I'm going to plot that. So that's my elevation model. Um, I played around with the colors for a while on this, and I couldn't come up with anything that was extra good looking. So we're just going to go with sufficient in this case. So I'm going to use the terrain colors. Um, function, um, it just picks, it's a it's a color ramp. Um, in this case, I'm going to ask it for 50 colors to make it pretty smooth. Um, you could do play with it, see what you like. Um, again, R is not great for making maps. Um, I'm turning off the axes. So axes equals false takes off the axes. Um, and legend equals false. Um, similarly, turns off the legend. Um, because otherwise it made a legend that was bigger than the plot. So I just want to get rid of it. Um, turning out colors. Um, again, like I said, <laughs> I should be copying and pasting, but I'm trying to be good and uh, type along. Um, it's giving me a lot of error messages, but because I'm just plotting this to look at it, I'm not worried about that um, because this generally looks like um, 
right here is the peninsula of San Francisco and this is like Marin over here. Um, again, like I said, this isn't beautiful. It's just to, to prove a point that we can plot it. All right, so I've got that. And then I can also, again, add on, um, like if I wanna add my streams, I can do plot uh, watershed streams. We want the 3310 versions that everybody matches. Um, you need to tell it to use the geometry column. Uh, for the color, let's tell it to be blue and add equals true, just like before. So if I run that, I should end up with, hopefully, if I spelled everything correctly, it plotted some streams on top of my data. And again, bordering on ugly, but that is okay. Um, and then I can also, um, I can add, if I wanted to add my polygons, or I could add my counties. Um, let's do our polygons. So I'm going to add my polygons for my watershed boundaries. Um, uh, let's do border equals gray 35, spelled the way it wants it. So you can remember to spell that right. <laughs> uh, and then add equals true. Um, and that should add Oh, I should have told it to be hollow. Um, anyway, let's just, let's get rid of that and just call this a success for plotting these guys. So again, you can monkey with all of this for a really long time, getting the plots just the way you want them. Um, but again, R is not your best bet for making pretty maps, um, or at least definitely not the plot function, not base plot. Um, so this is what we ended up with in the end. We've got our DEM. Um, and we've got our streams on top of it. And again, everything matches. It's in the right spot because we've got the right projection for every all of our data sets that we're trying to line up. Um, okay, so that is, um, that's the materials that I have for you today. Um, hopefully today you got a little bit better understanding of how, what projections are, why you care about them, um, some information about why you should spend the time to find the right projection uh, for your, uh, for your data um, and make sure that you pick something that is appropriate for not only your area, but what kinds of measurements and, and things you're trying to do, what kind of analysis you're trying to do. Um, and again, if you have more questions, the materials are available. Um, they'll stay online. Um, I'm going to show you the materials here just so I can point to stuff. Um, they'll stay online. We don't take them down. We do update them. So if stuff changes, that's why. Um, and then at the very bottom of the tutorial, I have some more references. Um, so like this book, Geocomputation with R by Robin Lovelace is online. It is excellent. I highly recommend uh, looking through that. It's got some really good um, information. Also rspatial.org as well as r-spatial.org. Um, that's not on here, but that's a good one too. Um, and finally, if your brain needs a break today, check out the map projection fun section at the bottom with some different map projection fun things like XKCD comic about it. Um, you can actually print some projections and uh, fold them up and make little globes. So that could be fun if you need a break or you want a project to do with your kids or just need a coloring break and it's, you know, craft time. Um, that's really there for, for fun. All right. So I wanna thank you all for coming today. Um, I'll stick around and I'm happy to answer more questions. If there are any, go ahead and put them in the chat. Um, if not, um, then we'll move on, but I'll, I'll give you a second to type any questions and then. Um, so I'm seeing a question, a little bit of an R question, not a PRJ question. Um, is there time for that? Yeah, sure, we can, we can talk some R questions. We've got some folks on the call too, I think who are, are pretty good with R in general, so. Feel free to chime in, folks. Uh, Tara has a good question. It's important for the DEM to be distance preserving or area preserving. Um, that is a good question. And I would say um, mostly I would think about how you want to work on your analysis. So if you are doing like a least cost path, I would make sure that you've got um, like distance preserving and you're working in a distance preserving uh, projection, but if you're concerned about area, then obviously you want to do area preserving. So that really you want to think about what um, what your analysis is as well to help you pick what what kind of projection you want. But yeah, definitely um, I would do some more reading on that too. Um, like I said, the um, 
to another commercial. I don't know this author, but this book is really good. GIS Fundamentals. I really like this one. But again, there are other good projection um, explaining books as well um, out there and some good websites too. So um, definitely I would I would do some more reading on that one as, as well. But I will say it does matter and you want to make sure you pick the right thing. Um, other questions? Okay, so what I think I will do is I'll go ahead and stop the recording and then we can just chat in person in case anyone is um, not wanting to record their voice. So again, thank you everyone for coming. Uh, this has been fun. Hopefully you learned some stuff and I'm gonna go ahead and stop our recording now. <laughs>